Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 8. Now Saul, consenting to his death, at that time a great persecution arose against the church which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in the city. We're right on the tail end of Stephen preaching his magnificent sermon. And then he became the first martyr of the church. He was stoned to death. And y'all seen the Braveheart movie where the guy yells out, Freedom, at the very end. Stephen yells out, Forgive them. He yells out, Forgiveness. His dying breath, the Bible says he cried out with a loud voice, Forgive them. Don't lay this charge to, to their account. And then he fell asleep. And it says, verse 1, Now Saul was consenting to his death. This word in the Greek, soon eudakeo, means he was enthusiastic about it. Eudakeo, when we say this word, we speak of blessing. When we say blessed is the one who's blessed us and all, so it's all spiritual blessings. It's the word eudakeo. He gave his blessing on, over it, okay? He, he delighted in it. He was pleased with it. It was good to him. So when we say consent, it's not that he reluctantly consented. He was enthusiastic about seeing people get killed who were heretics. That's Saul. He was the son, uh, student of Gamaliel, the Bible says. Now Gamaliel, a, a few chapters before, he's the one that stopped the Sanhedrin from killing people. They had the, all the apostles rounded up and in jail. And Gamaliel shows up and says, don't kill them. If this thing's of God, you don't want to mess with it. But now his student was the one who revved him up to go the extra mile and go to kill him. I have no doubt that Saul of Tarsus is the one that locked horns with Stephen and got him in the place that he was where the Sanhedrin got a hold of him. And Saul was there, and he's mentioned as the one that they laid their clothes down at his feet when Stephen was martyred for the faith. I also believe that Saul's the one that recorded his sermon because the Sanhedrin was there and nobody took note of this sermon besides Saul when he becomes a convert in chapter 9, Paul the apostle. says, he delighted, consented, blessed this man's death enthusiastically, and at that time, a great persecution arose against the church. The word time in the Greek is not chronos or kairos. It's the word himera. On that day, persecution arose. Himera is day. From that day on, there was a great, it sparked a great persecution against the church. And this word great is the word notable. This was not just regular persecution. Up until this time, they had imprisoned people, but they hadn't killed people. For They hadn't killed Christians yet. But now, this has gone up a notch, and it's got Saul written all over it. That From that day forward, they just, it, it, it set a wildfire or persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and it scattered 
uh, the believers throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. I believe that it scattered them to Samaria because a good Jew doesn't go into a Samaritan's house. A good Jew doesn't go into a Gentile's house. You'd be defiled. And they were going to everybody's houses, but the believers said, let's go someplace they won't find him. You ever seen that movie where the guy hides in a dead carcass of an animal so that his pursuers won't find him? That's maybe a grotesque idea, but that's what came to my mind. Uh, it's like, let's go someplace they won't ever go. And they went to the Samaritans, which were half-breed Jews, they were the northern kingdom that bred with the Assyrians when, the, when Assyria came in and sacked the northern kingdom of Israel. And the Assyrians, the way they overtook a, per, a, a, a people was they would inbreed with them. They would mate with them. And here comes these Samaritans. And the Jewish people are pure blood. They don't believe in intermarriage. Okay? And, and so they, the, Jew, the Christians didn't have any place to go, but let's go to Samaria. That's a great idea. So throughout Judea they went, and up into Samaria, which was north of Jerusalem, they hide out except the apostles. And why did the apostles not flee? I think when the Titanic's going down, it's the captain of the ship that's got to stay with it. And I think that uh, for the apostles to have left at that point, for them personally, would have been treacherous. Betrayal. They said, we're staying put. No matter what happens to us, we are here with our sheep. But a, how many of you know a, a pastor doesn't have the privileges that private people always have? Uh, you may feel led to go to another church. I can't do that. <laughs> and how many of you know I probably shouldn't do that? All right? The apostles stayed put and said, we're not going to let anybody run us off. They had obligations to widows. They had obligations to uh, their sheep. Jesus said hirelings, when it gets bad, they run off. When a wolf comes in to scatter the sheep, a hireling will say, I'm out of here. I don't want to mess with this. But a good shepherd says, let's go. I'm ready to fight. I'm not going anywhere. How many of you are thankful that Jesus doesn't run off when you go through something? He's a good shepherd. And... God puts people that are leaders in place that aren't supposed to run. They're supposed to stay and stick. And by God's grace, I'm not going to run either. I'm going to stay put. How many of you appreciate that about a preacher? Now, y'all can go play. Y'all go try out every buffet of Christianity there is. I'm staying put. Amen. So everybody except the apostles... Man, they got scared, and they and they scattered. Verse 2, And devout men carrying Stephen to his burial made great lamentation over him. Devout men, we don't know if these devout men are Christians or if they are devout Jews. If they are devout Jews, they still risk their life to bury Stephen. Burial is a very sacred thing that even the criminals were given. But you're not, according to the Mishnah, supposed to cry over criminals. And these men raise up a great lamentation, almost like a protest to his death. I think about uh, Joseph who asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Took a lot of boldness to go and ask for that body. And the same kind of thing is here. They risk their reputation, their lives to take him, carry him away, bury him, and then they make great lamentation over him. How many of you know it's okay to cry? It's okay to mourn over people when you lose them. And this word lamentation means they beat, literally it means to beat the head and to beat the heart. They lost it over this guy. This guy was a devout man, a good man. Devout is uh, Eudochian in the Greek. It means to, uh, to uh, grab a hold of the good. They cleave to the good. These are devout men who wouldn't let go of the good. And they, would, and they carried Stephen and they made lamentation over him. Verse 3, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. The word havoc in the Greek is the word that is given 
of a wild animal tearing into a carcass. He just ravaged the church. He tore it apart. Entering into every house. In the Greek, again, it is entering house to house. House after house. He just went to the whole neighborhood. And one house after the other. Could you imagine somebody coming into your house and dragging you off for your faith? Paul goes on to say that he didn't just, he, he didn't just preside over one man's killing. But in chapter 26, Paul gives his testimony as he's in chains. And he said, I did this also in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I put in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. That means there was torture involved. He would torture them and kill them. Exactly. Da na 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 na. Everybody, turn your phones off, please, just for this hour, and then you can be on them for the rest of your life. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to the foreign cities. And while I was thus occupied, that's when he has this Damascus Road encounter. So he wasn't a good guy, but he was very zealous, thought he was doing right. He took pleasure. He said uh, in Galatians, and it, no, it's in Timothy, 1 Timothy, he says, I was an insolent man. Insolent means I took pleasure in cruelty. He was something else, you guys. And uh, he ripped the church apart. He went in house after house, dragging men and women. He didn't care if you were a man or a woman. And he put them into prison, and he dispossessed them of all their land. And when did they come out? A lot of them didn't come out. I don't know if any of them came out. This wasn't, hey, you're getting fined. This is, we're killing you. We're torturing you. You either recant or die. Committed them to prison. The word prison means cage. He took them out of their beautiful homes and put them in cages. Uh, therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. And the title of my message today is, What is Therefore, Therefore? What is Therefore, Therefore? You remember what Jesus said in the Great Commission? All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. And make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I've heard people say, I'm not called to be an evangelist. That's not my gifting. Have you heard this? We pay people to preach and to be an evangelist. You got, you know, Scott Camp will come and preach, and people come to Christ when Scott Camp preaches. That's what I've noticed. He's gifted in it. But these are people that when they were scattered, they begin to preach the word. They're a bunch of no names. And they begin to preach because the commandment of the Great Commission is not just to evangelists, it's to the whole church. When he says, go you therefore, it is not a suggestion. It is a command of God. He doesn't say, hey, the ones that are really gifted and the rest of you, you know, go do some basket weaving for God or whatever. No, here, the, here we move into a place where it's not just the apostles preaching. It's not just the deacons preaching. It's the church that starts to preach at this place. They've continued in the apostles' doctrine They've listened to what has been said, but now they all start preaching. And I'm believing God for a church that's a preaching mighty church. That it's not just John Lee who's preaching, it's all of you preaching. 
and that the therefore gets a hold of your life as well as mine, and we start preaching. Everywhere we go, we preach the word. What is the therefore, therefore? Why does it say, verse 4, therefore, when they were scattered, and the word scattered here is different. It's the word to spread. Paul or Saul scatters the church, but now they're spread. It means they went through sowing seed everywhere they went. It's like God took a whole bunch of seed and just went like this all over Samaria, all over Judea. Jesus said you're going to be in Jerusalem, and then you're going to preach in Samaria and Judea and then to the other parts of the world. And how did he do it? He used persecution to get them out of their comfort zone. Isn't that wild? But here it is that I find that is interesting. There's four megas in this passage, or great. Mega in the Greek, great in the English. It says there was a Great persecution that came against the church through Saul. And then it says, the men made great lamentation over Stephen dying. And then it says that the devil started crying out with a loud voice. That's the word mega, great voice. And then verse 8, there was great joy in the city. Four greats, four, four megas. I don't want to live my life based upon the past where there's been great persecution and great sorrow. I've got to plug into the therefore of what God has called me to do and not react to what everybody else has done to me. If I don't preach, I lose my life because it is in my preaching that I find my life. It is in I mean, not just hearing about Christ, but it coming out of my mouth. My life is in my ministry. Or else all I've got to look forward to is what people have done to me. The megas of my past. And do you know as a Christian, you don't suffer a little. I was thinking about us. We're the most self-indulgent generation in the history of the world. In the history of America, my grandparents, some of your great-grandparents, some of your parents, they learned about sacrifice and victory. They sacrificed in World War II, but our kids don't know a thing about it. It's all about me, me, me all the time. How do you take... Now, when I read about these people spreading the word, I mean, they just got kicked out of their homes. They got dispossessed. They're running for their lives. Therefore, let's just go preach. When you don't have... Y'all, wait, I'm going to bring it home. I'm trying to get there, all right? But when, don't, when you don't have running water, you got to go to a well. When people die of diseases all over the place, when life is harder and you have less to lose, maybe you'd be more devoted to something. Then I just got my feelings hurt. My, my, my dinner is a little cold. Um, I wonder sometimes in this American culture of my rights and equal rights and the government hasn't done me right and I haven't gotten mine and freedom of everything. And I wonder how you deal with an American culture and try to turn them to a, be a Christian. How do you sell that unless you just go prosperity gospel? And say, I know how to get you to the, from the cross to the Statue of Liberty in no time flat. And everything's going to be peachy keen. And you can have lots of money and it's just going to be gravy. But you start messing with people's houses. You start dispossessing them. You almost have to be New Testament in order to be a real Christian back then. But then I think, but we all, no matter what's been sold to us, no matter what we have, think we deserve, we all have still, as Christians, extremed, experienced extreme persecution. Maybe not to the point of death, but how many of you know we've been rejected? How many of you know the devil really has hunted us down? 
How many of you have lost somebody that you really cared about? Where you about beat your chest and your head all at the same time over losing somebody very precious to you? What is the therefore, therefore? Last year we lost, I want to say six spouses in this church. People that we, I say lost, we send them to heaven. and We will see them again. But at our cost, I think about the people that sitting in this service today that have been rejected by spouses. Think about the deep pain they deal with all the time. They basically survived their way into this church service today. What is the therefore, therefore? Why are we all called to preach and not just John? Well, let's find out. Why? I'm going to give you five keys to overcome in your past today. To overcome the mega persecution and the mega sorrows of your past. This is what you need to commit your life to doing, and you'll do just fine. All right? Here we go. Number one, therefore, they preached the word. Why? Because they had been rejected, and they were dealing with great sorrow. Therefore, they preached the word. Why preach the word? What is the word? Well, preaching in the Greek is euangelion. It is... Uh, the good news. They gospelized the word. Basically, they took the Bible and they put Jesus all in it. They took the Old Testament and they pointed to Jesus in everything. You look at Philip here down the road talking to the eunuch, verse 35, and Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture preached Jesus to him. They preached the scriptures. And as long as I'm the pastor, I will preach the word of God, okay? I don't, I'm not into series. You can go someplace else for a series. You can do all that stuff. I'm going to go verse by verse. I'm going to make that thing pop every Sunday morning. As it pops in my heart, I'm popping over to you, okay? It's all I care about. And people that resonate and love the word and need the word, man, you can't just be listeners of the word. you got to preach it. Whatever light you've been given, you walk in that light, and then God will give you more light. But everybody in this place, you listen to the word, you come in here and hear it until it starts coming out of your mouth. Man, I have people that come here and they talk all their problems and all their stuff and somebody dispossessed them out of their house and this and that. Somebody did this to them, did that to them. You know, a lot of Christians, they think God's mad at them when they're having a bad day and happy with them when they're having a good day. That's not what these people did. They preached the Word. What's the Word? The Word's a testimony of Scripture. You're going to be epically rejected. You're going to deal with epic sorrow. You've got to get over to the place where the devils are crying out epically because you're taking ground for the kingdom of God. And you're not going to quit until you hit pay dirt on epic joy for your life. And the whole thing's going to be God's megaphone. The testimony of your life. Because mega stuff has happened to you. And you've done some mega stuff too. Praise God. But the first thing you've got to do is start preaching the word to yourself. You've got to get those scriptures that have changed your life, anchored your life, and preach them. Preach them. Why, are we, why do we have spouses? So that we can practice on them so we can go preach to others. Why do we have children? So we can go practice on them. If we're scared of talking to people in the public place, start on who you're around. And they start preaching to each other. And they had Philip who was an evangelist. He was a ringleader. You've got to have ringleaders in your group that kind of stir you on. And I'm sure he got a bunch of them in Samaria and said, let's have a home group meeting. I'm going to preach the word to you. And then you go say what I just said. And they went out and started preaching too. I don't preach to you so you listen and go home and watch fried chicken television, whatever you do. I preach to you so you start preaching. You're not the first person who's ever had tragedy in your life. 
That book is full of it, but it doesn't end there. It ends in glory. Therefore, therefore, preach the word. Secondly, preach Christ. The Bible says, Philip, preach Christ to them. Don't just preach the word. And let me say the word is not just the Bible. Sometimes the word is the word of your testimony. You got to tell people what God's done in your life, man. What you saw, man, God did some stuff. And then things got a little hot and you had to scatter. But you've seen, you've had experience with God. And I'm preaching not only the word in that, but how I've been affected by it, how it's changed my life. Preach the word. Gospelize that thing. Turn it into good news. That's what Jesus does. He takes that whole thing and makes it a big old package of good news for you. And then Philip just preached Jesus. He just preached Christ. He was in love with Christ. How many of you know you've got to put Christ right in front of you all the time? And he preached Christ. And he preached Christ. The word Christ means Messiah. These Samaritans were waiting for the Messiah. You remember the woman at the well? She said, when the Messiah comes, they were waiting for the Messiah to come. And Philip went and said, I know who the Messiah is, Jesus of Nazareth. He's the Messiah. And he went and preached to a bunch of half-breeds nobody liked. How many of you know God will send you places through persecution you'd never go otherwise? He makes you into the minister you are that you never would have been otherwise. Savor your rejection. Savor your sorrow. Makes you who you are. God works it all together for the good. He used that scattering to be spreading. Persecution is on the Lord's payroll. In spite of what they had been through, they preached Christ. Why? Because Christ was their life. Christ was their all in all. It was all for him. They would lost everything. But they counted it joy that they had Christ. Well, when you've lost a lot and you still love Jesus, isn't that something? Didn't Jesus say if you try to keep your life, you're going to lose it? But if you lose your life for my sake, you'll find it? See, it's not about the life you have. It's the life you find that is so important. Some of you are so bent on the life you've lost, you've got to find your life in this season. And you'll never find it if you don't have Christ in it. You've just got a bunch of deaths, a string of deaths all around your past without preaching the word and preaching the one who was raised from the dead for you. How many of you love Jesus today? How many of you preach Christ we can preach all kinds of things, but man, we've got to preach Christ and Him crucified and in Christ forgiveness of sins. Yes, everything else, but thank God for forgiveness. Can we just thank God for a moment of forgiveness? I mean, anybody can get over cigarettes or whatever, but thank God that He forgave me. See, the way I, I operate is in his forgiveness, man, that means that he crushes sin. He takes care of the whole thing when I'm forgiven. He said to the man who couldn't get up off the ground, hey, dude, your sins are forgiven you because you do so much for my business. And the guy couldn't move. Like, You're forgiven. His own friends had to lower him through the roof, and he just said, I like you. You're forgiven. Oh, so that you'll know I have the power to forgive sins? I say, rise up and walk. My good works, my righteous living does not earn my way into heaven. It is only a little bit of confirmation that I have been forgiven. But my forgiveness is in Christ Jesus. And my forgiveness worked its way all the way into me getting up off the ground and crying, mighty Jesus. Let me be thankful for the forgiveness of God. Come on, you guys. Amen. And you may know I have the power to forgive. I'm, I'm going to heal your life, too. How about that? 
I'm going to put you back together. You've not left anything that I'm not going to give you a hundredfold back now and this time with persecution. You never trade for less. Therefore, they preached the word. Therefore, they preached Christ. I don't know uh, if Philip said, man, they're coming to our house too. Let's get out of here. And they just took off. Whereas the apostles stood, stayed put, said, come get us. I don't know. I don't know if there's any kind of shame going on in Philip right now that he took off and the apostles stayed. I know he's in contact with them because when people start getting saved, he sends for them. So he may have said to them, hey, I've got a bunch of people dying over here. The apostle said, you take them and get out of here. We're going to stay put. We can't leave. I don't know how it worked. But if there was any shame in it, it's important, everybody, listen. Some of you go, should I have stayed in that situation or should I have left? Maybe you know the song, should I stay or should I go? Some of, sometimes we, we overthink our past and what we did. But we got to... We got to preach the word, but then sometimes we just got to preach Christ and not ourselves. And say, so, you know what? He, it's all about him and his righteousness and not about necessarily my track record and how wonderful I've been. You just got to preach Jesus, man. Not that he's Messiah only, but what kind of Messiah he is. He's a good shepherd Messiah. He's a forgiving Messiah not just knowing about him, it's knowing him personally, intimately. That's so important. Thirdly, you've got to make a commitment to live in victory. How many of you see that Philip went down there and he endured until the devils were screaming? How many of you are going to endure until the devil starts screaming? Until whatever routed you out of Jerusalem is screaming because you've resisted him until he fleed from you. Fled from you. Fleed? Fled. Resist him until he flees. I want to see the devils crying out this year over the stuff me and my friends have been put through. I want to... I don't want to be this guy that just knows how to suffer real good and get through stuff and smell bad and tell everybody how woe is me. Man, I want to live in victory over my sorrow. I want to live in victory over the rejection of my life. And I'm going to endure until devils are screaming out with a loud voice because I'm in the room. Here, kitty, kitty. You need to bow your shoulders back, say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. You can tread on me all you want, but you don't tread on Jesus in me. And what God has done in my life as I preach the word and I preach Jesus both to me and to you. I will stand my ground until I see the devils cry out over the ministry God has given me to do. When that secret agency of the Holy Spirit starts kicking devils out of people. Say, so well, why didn't the Sanhedrin have the devils kick? Because God has a plan and he's mysterious. But he's kicking them out of Samaritans left and right. And you don't know who. You might cancel somebody out and that's the person God's leading to him. You say, not that person. Those people are terrible. They're no good. We need to just call down fire on all those Samaritans. That's what John said. Jesus said, those are the people I'm going after next. I wonder if the woman at the well was there. All those people that had been led to the Lord, I wonder if she was there waiting for Philip and said, let me introduce you to a lot more. But it says, with one accord they came and took heed of the words how many of you want to endure until you see a harvest like one accord showing up? Like a whole multitude of one accord showing up because you've got the victory over your sorrow and you've got the victory over death and you've got the victory over your rejection, which was epic.
but you're going to have yourself an epic victory too because you're God's megaphone, and that is your life. Mega is what happens over in the Lee camp. And I don't know if this church will ever be a mega church, but it is a mega church to me because we have been through mega stuff and we're going to go do mega cool stuff for Jesus. Come on, somebody. Amen. I like my mega church. I like my mega friends. I know you've suffered mega well. Therefore, let's go preach the gospel because if we don't, we won't survive. Time do I have? Oh, I got two more points left. Fourthly, live to do good. How many of you know you can't be overcome with evil? You've got to overcome evil with good. Live selflessly. Go, go heal some people. Go see some people that are lame, paralyzed. Pray for them that God will heal them. Pray that your life is a healing to people. And it's not all this self-indulgent American, my rights have been violated I'm watching CNN and Fox News for the rest of my life. <laughs> trying to get mine while the getting's good. And if Jesus can help, I'll use him for a little bit. You Judas. You may lose everything. You may not, but you may. God may say, I got people coming into your house and they're going to take everything you got. Will you still will you still serve me? Are you wor see, it's it's are you worthy of Christ? He, Jesus said, if you don't love me more than everything, you're not worthy of me. How many of you want to be worthy of Christ? Absolutely. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. So if you love your wife and your kids, and your mama, and your daddy more than me. If you want to find your life, you've got to lose it for me. Because this is what it looks like to be a Christian, and most people don't want to play. They'd rather have their house than get kicked out of it. And I understand. But when you find Jesus as better than anything else, and as your only solution. Oh, and when you live only for him. There is no preacher without persecution. There is no preaching the word unless you've been through something where you've got to preach the word, where you have to preach Christ. Do you understand? You've been through something. And it's either go live back there or live right here. Commit your life to doing good. I don't want to bore you, but when I was, one more time, when I was 17 years old, we lost a big old church, big old ministry. Went from love to hate. I never knew what it was to be hated, but I felt it when I was 17 years old. Hated. Two years, I wallowed in all of that. And it wasn't just that it happened to me. It was that I had to get to a point where I realized I was bad business for everybody I cared about until I got over back into ministry. I hurt people without even trying. Do you know what I mean? There's a way you can tell fake repentance from good repentance, genuine repentance, one of the ways. Some people, if they get caught, they feel bad. That's not real repentance. For me, real repentance has something to do with being sorry that you've hurt others besides yourself. And I really came to a place where I realized I was hurting people close to me because I was living in the wallowing mire of my past. And when I was 19 years old, I remember I'm a very emotional young man. I got out of the shower at, the, at, at a ORU where I was going to school, and I'm weeping 
And I go into my closet in my dorm, and I said to the Lord, I'm in my towel in the closet on the floor, and I said, Lord, we've been through so much, but if you can still use me, I want to live. I don't want to die. And that week, a call came to my phone from an Assemblies of God guy saying, we need a youth pastor. And that church had 13 people in it, and they're all over 80, and I was going to be their youth pastor. <laughs> and a bunch of blue hairs that said, go round up our grandchildren. <laughs> and I got all my buddies, and I said, let's go over to this church. And God brought me back to life. And I've never stopped ministering since because I don't want to live in the 80s. I don't want to live. Does this make sense? Ministry is my lifeblood. I have to preach. The Great Commission is not an option for me. I have to preach Jesus out of my mouth every week and push the darkness back. And push the sorrow back and the rejection back and the hurt and the pain because it was mega dispossessed me, scattered us. And I had to make up my mind, I'm going to live my life doing good instead of being overcome by evil. I'm going to spend my life not just oh, I want to be a goody two-shoes. It's, I don't want to be bad business because I know how bad business I can be. So did Paul. So did all these other guys. You can't ride the fence for too long. I'm not saying you can't, but it ain't no fun. It's very hard on your crotch. <laughs> Riding the fence. Come on, somebody. Amen? <laughs> That's how I felt. It was terrible, and I don't want to do it no more. You'll remember that, because that's what it feels like, thinking lukewarm will keep you out of trouble. Let me put it to you this way. The safest place for you is in the perfect will of God. The safest place for you is right up next to Jesus. Fifthly, not only live to do good, but live to inspire joy. Live to inspire joy in others. I just want to make people happy. I, and it's not to please men. I just want to bring joy into people's lives. I want to lift their spirit. I want to say there's a reason for all of this. God's working it all together for the good. All of it. Let me show you, and I'll finish here. Can I show you something? If you go over to chapter uh, uh, 11, verse 19... Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. So they didn't just stop in Samaria. Then they started spreading out all the way back into the Roman Empire. A lot of them came at Pentecost, got saved at Pentecost. They were housed there and then only to lose everything and get scattered all back all over the Roman Empire. They go as far as Antioch, and it talks about Barnabas here. He's sent by the apostles to Antioch, and he confirms them in the faith. And, and then he goes to Tarsus to seek for Saul. And when he had found Saul, he brings him back to Antioch. And so it was for a whole year they assembled with the church and taught a great many people, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. What's the point? All those people Paul had run off land in Antioch, a bunch of them. And then he gets saved, and he goes and stays with them for a year. He may have killed some of their family. Persecution tries to give you a myopic, narrow view of life. You only can see what's going on right in front of you when you're having a real bad day. Through tribulation, persecution. You don't see what God's doing a few chapters down the road with your persecutors. 
How many of you know God always saves the wrong people? And that's why sometimes you're sitting there going, am I really saved? Because I really do know what I am. <laughs> How many of you ever have a little bit of anxiety because you remember what you are? But you've got to remember God only. He really specializes in the wrong people, so you're doing just fine. Come on, somebody. Amen. You'll be okay. It's going to be all right. you got to get through enough of the fires in your life and know that God had your back through that stuff and has made you the person that you are to say, hey, joy is on the way. For the joy set before me endured the cross. I know there's joy coming, and we just got to hold on until demons are screaming and there's great joy going like megaphone in people's lives. I live for joy. It's all a setup for great joy. Amen? Might start with great persecution, great sorrow, great all this business. I'm going to stay put right here until this church has mega joy. Amen. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen? Great joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Ha, 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 
Ricky, you're called to preach. Practice on your wife and go take it out to the streets. Amen. Bruce Hicks, you're a preacher. Preach the word. Preach Christ. Live in victory. Do good. Inspire joy. Be a stark contrast of all the things that have happened to you in this world. Don't be like them anymore. Don't agree with your haters. It's not time to die. It's not time to be shamed into the ground. It's time to live. I speak it over this church and over your life in Jesus' name. This is a season of life, and this is a season of joy. It's the only way I know how, okay? Everywhere you go, man, just go spread the joy. Go spread the good. Go heal somebody and live to see devils cry out. There's nothing as, as, as exciting when the Lord uses his finger or his foot to cast devils out of people. Amen. Oh, let's live for it in Jesus' name. Let's stand up this morning. Pastor Phil, I mean, it may look good on paper that we're preachers, but the truth is we had to survive. And we would have been over, we would have been swallowed up by our sorrow had we not answered the call to preach and say, I'm going to stick Jesus right in front of my face until I see him face to face. And I'm going to be used for the gospel. Even on my bad days, God's working it all to make me a bigger megaphone for him. How many of you today just say, John, I heed the word of the Lord this morning and I'm saying no to my sorrow. And I'm saying no to my rejection. Let me see your hand today. Amen. It's been epic. It's been epic. How many of you say it has been epic what the enemy has done to me? Lift up your hand. Be honest. And nobody knows but you how epic it's been. But how many of you with the other hand say, Jesus, Jesus, I'm ready for the epic of what you're going to do in my life for this year. Can you say today, John, I'm ready to see in one accord a multitude come to Jesus through what I've been through in my life. Can you lift up your hands to Jesus and say, Lord, just use me. I just want to be used by you. I want you to use my life. God, if you can do anything with this life, God, take my life. I want to live. I don't want to die. I want to live. I want to be your minister. I want your word in my mouth. I want, your, I want Christ to be preached from my life. I want to commit my life to doing good. I want to be a joy to my family. I want to live in victory over my sin and over my sorrow in Jesus' name. Now, this is what I prayed this morning before I got finished with my prayer time. The Lord told me in my spirit, he said, have them ask me for them to live. I want you to lift up your heart to the Lord right now and just say, Lord, I want to live. I don't want to die. I want to live. Just say it to him right now. Just say, Lord, I want to live. I want to live. I don't want to die. I don't want to just exist. Now pray it as a prayer to the Lord. Everybody repeat after me and say it loud if you can from your heart. I want to live.